This is a self-portrait of the German artist Otto Dix. And here's a portrait of Otto Dix by Amory Safer. The German word for it is Zeitgeist. The spirit, the outlook, the summing up of the age. And Otto Dix, an artist of humble beginnings, spent most of his life trying to capture it in the Germany of the early 20s. The degradation of war, post-war despair, the combination of hope and decadence that flowered in the doomed Weimar Republic. Its fancy fashions, its brothels, its erotic headlong rush to even greater disaster. All reflected in these images on view at New York's Neue Gallery. Rene Price is the gallery's director. Most of his drawings and paintings have a certain edge and even brutality to them. But then there are a few that are very gentle. I think what makes this artist so very interesting is that he is able to stylistically change. He was really an artist that was interested in the moment. Dix was born in 1891, the son of an iron worker and a seamstress. He studied at the School of the Arts in Dresden, but when war broke out in 1914, he joined the army. This was to be the war that ends all wars, but it was unbelievable carnage on both sides. 15 million died in the four years of war. Dix, who led a machine gun squad, was wounded several times, but the deepest wounds were what he saw. It was almost as though he was challenging, you know, his own destiny. One could say either he was borderline crazy or he was just so unbelievably courageous that he really endured it for such a long uh, period of time. The years in the trenches inspired hundreds of drawings, an uncensored panorama of the true faces of war. The images of war, they're both repellent and mesmerizing at the same time. You can't take your eyes off them. Yes, of course, it's very timely. I mean, we, you know, we are at war uh, in different parts uh, of the world, and this is something that I think people can still relate to today. The faces of the man, and especially their eyes, that is known as the thousand-mile stare. That look is a kind of universal look. Yeah, and that's, I think, why people are still so drawn to that. The images haunted his life. In 1924, he produced 50 etchings that apart from the weapons, could be a catalog of any war in any era. The worms, the only true victors, the agonies, universal. He wasn't consciously trying to make an anti-war statement. No, he was but not. You don't make pictures like that without the result being anti-war. No, that's true. The artist has a certain need for truth and he felt that people had shunned away from showing the ugliness of humanity and that was part of his quest is to just show it all post-war berlin was a cauldron of in-your-face creativity he painted fellow artists like the actor heinrich george and journalist Sylvia von Harden. Dick seemed to revel in ugliness, crime scene sex murders, prostitutes. It was tabloid journalism as cultural commentary. The preponderance of the work was sex, death, and violence. Yes, Eros was a big component, yes eroticism, sexuality, showing forbidden things, showing ugly things, had a fascination. And, you know, in the height of the Weimar Republic, Berlin was the center. This was the period of cabaret. Or, uh, yes, or, that's right. right. And there was no better artist who depicted that era than Otto Dix. And you can see that in the portraits here in this exhibition. Portraits like this of Anita Berber, she was the iconic vamp of Berlin in the 20s. Outrageous in every way. Silent film star, new dancer, 
endless affairs with men and women, cognac and cocaine addict, often dressed in furs and jewels and little else. She is on canvas the star of the show, just as she was in life. The red dress was actually black, but Dix painted it red just to make her look like the sort of the epitome of sin or that Scarlet flame. Woman. Yes, of course, also, yes. She was 26 at the time. Dix painted her to look as though she was 66. And within three years, she died. By then, Dix was considered the premier German portrait painter. He was part of the Neue Sachlichkeit, or New Objectivity Movement. Essentially, it was brutalism. His models were musicians and poets, lawyers, doctors, a mother and child. His portraits could be tender, but mostly they were unflattering, like this one, Dr. Heinrich Stadelman. Why would anyone want their portrait to be painted by Otto Dix? I mean, this is... You don't like this? Well, I like it as a painting, but I don't know if I'd like him painting if my that were portrait. You. Uh, well, this was a very interesting man, a psychiatrist, and he used hypnosis. And I think that's one of the reasons why his eyes are one of the focal points of the picture. But his favorite face was his own. Was he a vain man? By all means. He was a vain man, there isn't a doubt in my mind. He slicked his hair back, he wore these narrow neckties. He was always impeccably dressed. And I think, you know, he loved the ladies and uh, I mean, yeah, he definitely was me. He painted himself over and over again. A soldier, the artist with his muse, a family man, and his wife Martha. But most of his work had a nasty edge. Rene Price says that even in the early 20s, a portent of what was to come became evident in Dix's work. As in this portrait of Dr. Fritz Glaser, a lawyer and art patron. This is really the prediction and the situation of a German Jew in 1922 with this metaphoric winter outside and a loft that seems to be a construction site and in a certain sense is being frozen uh, out of his existence. In 1933, Hitler came to power. Dix, along with dozens of other artists, was declared degenerate. He retreated to the countryside where he painted sweet pastoral landscapes and inoffensive religious paintings. The man had a family. He wanted to survive. He gave a message. In the last painting in our exhibition is 1939, and it's St. Christopher, this large figure carrying the little Christ child through a, a river. And, and the message, of course, is that, you know, we will get through this. We will pass to safer shores and we will move on. Otto Dix survived the war and he continued to paint, but was largely forgotten. He died in 1969. As a young man, he declared with a certain bravado, either I will become famous or notorious. Now, 40 years after his death, he has achieved both. He also left us a powerful legacy of human folly at its very worst.